And in 1971, there was this movement called the Jesus Movement that was thriving around our country. Um, it was gaining a lots, of, lots of momentum, and there were loads of people called Jesus people running around and uh, coming to Christ. And many of you lived through this movement, did you not? So uh, help me out, because I was born after the Jesus Movement um, started. Um, I was born in the middle of the Jesus Movement, so um, I don't remember the Jesus Movement. I'm curious, what was it all about? I mean, when you think about the Jesus Movement, those of you who lived through it and experienced some of it, when you saw it, when you remember back, what, what were they doing? What was the whole point? What were they trying to get at in the Jesus Movement? So it's a movement that kind of sparked some new things yeah. and agitated the church to yeah. be different. Okay. So a revival. Yes. A revival of the church. So it's pushing the country in a good way. Was there a good response to the Jesus movement? Or how did, how did it go just culture-wide? Was it kind of looked at as like, wow, those people are wacky? Or was it... Yes. Was there, yeah. Both? Is that what you said? It was kind of, don't get over it. <laughs> don't get over it. <laughs> They'll figure it out so far. Don? Yeah, 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 right. Most people call them Jesus Freaks. Part of the hippie. It had a relationship with hippie fringe. Hippie fringe. Jesus, oh, Jesus sandals. Because you want to walk like Jesus. So as, as if, if you didn't hear, as a non-believer at the time, it just didn't seem like it was for them. But there was something. There was something going on. So Karen Lafferty was a woman um, who was a product of the Jesus movement. She, um, she was in college at the time that the Jesus movement launched. And uh, she, was, she graduated from school in 1970, 71, and she uh, received a music degree when she graduated. She came to know Jesus, and she became a worship leader at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, which was one of you know, the, the leading churches in the whole Jesus movement, at least on the West Coast, and the beginning of the whole Calvary Chapel movement. And uh, Karen was in a Bible study uh, one time in this, in this year or so with a group of friends, and they were studying Matthew chapter 6. And as they were reading it and praying through it and studying it, there was a verse that seemed to pop out and sit with her deeper than the others. And so being a musician and a worship leader, she wrote a song about that verse. Uh, it's possible that you might, maybe, Know the song, it goes like this. Anybody heard that one? church at all, or if you've been alive, you know that song. I mean, I remember that song at camp, I remember that song in youth group, I remember that song in church. It has been published in almost every single hymnal since it was written. I mean, it is one of probably the most popular uh, praise songs that has ever been written. So what's it about? I mean, seek the kingdom live righteously, what's going to be added? I mean, why, is, why is Jesus talking about these things? I think Jesus was talking about all this because Jesus cares about how we live. Jesus cares about every decision we make. Jesus doesn't just care about our eternity and our future someday and in heaven. Jesus cares about everything we do. You know, he cares about how we pray. He cares about how we use the stuff we have. He cares about the decisions we make. He cares about how we treat people. He cares about everything. And that's not just someday in the future when we're in heaven. That's now. And so Jesus has this deep abiding passion for the stuff that happens here and what we do. And because of that, Jesus talked about these kinds of things. We, we're calling these the fine print things this year uh, because it's the details. It's the minutia of how do we work out a relationship with God. You know, if the big picture, if the whole idea of God in the Bible is that we have a relationship with God, 
this is the world. How does it work? You know, how does it work every moment and every day and in, at every turn of decisions and things that we deal with? How does it work? And so most of the books about Jesus, you know, the Matthew, the Mark, Luke, and John, most of those books are about fine print stuff. It's about the details. Jesus talks most of the time about how to deal with things and how to make a decision and where to go and what to do. That's most of what we live with. And so Jesus cares deeply about how we live and what we do. He cares about the fine print kind of things. So Jesus' largest block of teaching that he gave is called the Sermon on the Mount. And we've been looking at that for the past few weeks, looking at different parts of it and in how it relates to living out a relationship with God. We've covered all kinds of topics, and we've covered prayer, and we've covered um, some other things. I'm sure they were important. <laughs> we've covered all kinds of things. So let's start with that. Give me a second. I'm sure. Oh, we, we, we covered the whole salt and light. How do we salt and light? We covered, we covered the law. See, it's coming back. It's coming back. We covered the law. And, you know, how did, what does it mean to have rules and right and wrong, and what do we do with that? Um, we talked about prayer, and what does it mean to pray, and how does that work? Well, Jesus keeps on going throughout that whole block of teaching, talking about all kinds of details of things about our lives and how we do those things. And as he does talk about all those little things, it seems like in this big teaching, all those details relate to one big thing. And that big thing seems to be that Jesus wants our attention. And I don't mean to say that Jesus is kind of trying to grab our attention or get our attention. Jesus wants us to be asking, where is my attention? Where is our attention? What are we paying attention to? What are we giving our attention to? He wants to probe us and kind of ask us to assess ourselves. Where is our attention? So I suppose it's no surprise um, that the attention of the people that Jesus was teaching was on a couple main things that he addresses directly. I'm guessing they're probably some of the same things that we tend to pay attention to. Uh, would anybody like to hazard a guess on either of those two things that most people in the world pay attention to all the time? One would be money and stuff. And the other would be worry and fear. Anybody experienced either one of those? Thinking about money and stuff, thinking about worry and fear? All right, every hand, every hand. Because we do. Every, everybody thinks about money and stuff because we have to, and worry and fear because we do. We all deal with all of these things. We're no different than they are, and they're no different than we are. Uh, we, we have to deal with stuff and things, and we constantly think about, do I have enough? Do I have the right stuff? Do I need new stuff? And if so, how do I get that stuff? And then we wonder, how do I take care of that stuff? And I'm worried about things, and I'm worried about other people, and I don't know where to go, and I have fears about what to do. And so Jesus, knowing that this is all a part of our lives, Jesus says this. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is... There the desires of your heart will also be. I think the word treasure is kind of formal. So let's put another word in there. Let's put stuff in there. Don't store up stuff here on earth, etc. Store your stuff in heaven where it can't be destroyed. For where your stuff is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Clearly he's talking differently about stuff. You know, the stuff that moths eat and people take, that's the stuff we buy and the stuff we get and the stuff that stays here. What he longs for is for us to have stuff that has a longer term impact. And what's interesting is, you know, the stuff we do here, the things we do, the life we live, the fine print things we do, it matters. It doesn't necessarily just remain here. I mean, there's some link between the way we live out a relationship with God and forever. However that works, there's some relationship there. And so Jesus says, start now. Do these treasure stuff things here that have an eternal, lasting impact. Jesus wants our attention to be on that kind of stuff, not this kind of stuff. So then Jesus goes on. 
Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Uh, people in Jesus' day understood the eye like a filter. Uh, it was a filter for the rest of the body. So whatever you filtered in affected everything. So if you filtered in really good stuff, then you had a light shining in your body, the, you know, a light, of, a light of Christ. If you filtered in bad stuff, evil stuff, sinful stuff, gross stuff, that's what you were going to be filled with. And so Jesus is saying, pay attention to the stuff that you let in. Because we all have choices about what can come through and what can come in. Pay attention to what goes in. So then Jesus sums up, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So bottom line, where's our attention? Is it on this? Is it on that? Is it on light? Is it on darkness? Is it on money? Is it not? Is it on stuff? Is it on eternal things? Where's our attention? Because Jesus wants our attention. Because where our attention will be, where our eye is, where our stuff is, that's where our heart or the rest of us will be. That's just the natural correlation. So what are we going to pay attention to? That's the money part. Now the worry part. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him? Do you have a word in there? Hmm, there's an extra word in mine. I don't know why I had the word really in here. Um, it would read, really, aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Anyway, can, you all, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies in the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So are those fair comparisons? You know, we're not birds. We're not flowers. So is this fair? Well, let's think about the comparison. Birds provide for themselves. They provide their own food. They go get it. They have to find it. So they have to feed themselves and they feed their families. But can birds worry? Do they have the capacity to worry? As far as we know, I don't think so. Their brains aren't developed to worry. How about flowers? Do flowers go get their own food? No. I mean, they have roots and it draws in. I mean, you could talk about you know, all that stuff. But they don't necessarily go out and get their own food. They don't travel to get it. They don't have to go buy it. They, they don't. And, and do flowers worry? Am I going to bloom this year? Or am I going to look nice? Or what color will I do? Do they worry? No, flowers don't worry. So is it a fair comparison for Jesus to say, the birds, don't feed, the birds feed themselves, but they don't worry. The lilies don't feed themselves and don't worry. And so you don't worry. I mean, because they don't have to do as much as we do. But Jesus' point is that God cares for them and provides all the stuff they need, and they can't even have the ability to go get it. And you who have all the ability to go get it, why are you worrying about it? You have far, we have far more ability than they do, and still we're provided for. Where's our attention? Is it on the fact that God provides for everything, and yet we still worry? Or is there our attention on the fact that we just have a huge responsibility and we've got to go get it and we have lots of things that we need to worry about? Well, so Jesus summarizes this whole idea just a verse later. And he says, so don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today, today's troubles 
Trouble is enough for today. We've all heard that verse a million times, and we've probably told it to somebody. Don't worry, tomorrow's enough worries. Just relax, it's okay. Have you ever described somebody as a stoic? And what does it mean when you describe somebody as a stoic? Now that person's kind of stoic. What does that mean? Sorry. Doesn't mean like no emotion, but Okay, no emotion, handle a lot, don't see the stress. They do not show their emotions. Yeah. They flat emotionally. Can a stoic be a grumbler? Can a stoic be a grumbler? Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was a stoic. Yes. Non-feeling. Non-feeling. Yeah, the stoics are just kind of even keeled and no emotion. Sometimes it's a good thing. Is it? Sometimes it's a bad thing, too. I mean, it's not always a compliment to be called a stoic. In Jesus' day, stoicism was the rage. It was an up-and-coming movement. It was like the Jesus movement in the 70s. It was a huge up-and-coming philosophy in the time of Jesus where people were being drawn to stoicism. It was like this new thing. And there's a guy named Epictetus who lived just after Jesus. And he basically was the stoicism guru. And he articulated all the stuff that people have been talking about and thinking about related to stoicism right before him. So he, he summarized stoicism. And here's what he says about worry. He says, Oh, there is only one way to happiness, and that is to cease worrying about things which are beyond the power of our will. Compare that with Jesus. Does that sound similar? Yeah, basically, don't worry. Everybody loved this whole philosophy. Just don't worry. Everything's fine. But there's a huge difference between the stoic response to worry and the Jesus response to worry. Because the way that stoicism responded is, don't worry. End of story. There's nothing you can do. Just don't worry. Jesus says, don't worry, but, and Jesus' key verse is, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. In other words, don't worry, but give your attention to God's kingdom and live the way God wants you to live. And that's when all these things can come to you that you're worried about. Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God. It appears in all kinds of places throughout the gospel books. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, he talks about it all the time, as if people really understood everything that he was talking about. And what's really funny is people have written articles and books and argued about what is the kingdom of God. I mean, for decades, people have argued about what is this kingdom. And he talks about it like everybody knew. And I think they did know. Because it's full, the Old Testament is full of the kingdom of God language. God has talked for a long time about the kingdom of God. And the way God talked about it in the Old Testament through prophets and through leaders and through others was that someday God is going to bring this time when God's in charge. And that's called the kingdom of God. And the way that they talked about it was, was this kingdom was peaceful. And this kingdom is, is going to be beautiful. And this kingdom is going to reward you and give you everything you ever wanted. This is the kingdom that God sets up for us. It's full of everything that people long for. And so when prophets would talk about that, it would give people the sense of, okay, I can last through this. When rulers would talk about it, people would say, well, I want this now, and maybe you're the king that can bring that kingdom. So kingdom language, kingdom of God was all over the place for people. Now, of course, we don't live in kingdoms, and we don't have kings, so it doesn't resonate with us quite in the same way. But when Jesus said, seek the kingdom above all else, they knew what he's talking about. Seek that thing that God's going to bring. Seek that thing that God has promised for a long time that fulfills the desires of your heart. That's the kingdom. But Jesus talked about it differently, too. Jesus didn't talk about it as something that God's going to bring someday way out there. 
Jesus talked about it here. Like Jesus was actually bringing the kingdom. So when Jesus said, seek the kingdom, it's like Jesus is saying, join in. Because it's already here. Jesus brought the kingdom so that we could experience this thing that God has promised for us. And the way we experience it is we live in a relationship with God. And when we live in that relationship, we experience all this that God has in store for us. We get to live the kingdom. And so when Jesus says, seek the kingdom of God, it's not seek it and look for it. Like, I can't quite find it. Seek it out. It's pursue it. Give your attention to it. Because the kingdom is here. And then he says, and live righteously. Some versions of this say, um, seek his righteousness. And others say, live righteously. You know, live righteously just takes it a step further. You know, if we're seeking his righteousness, it means we want to live that way. We want to pursue living in a right way. So pursue his righteousness. Live righteously. What does it mean to seek or pursue or live God's righteousness? It, it means to live it. It means to live the way that God wants us to live. So seek out, pursue the life that God has in store and live it. And when we do that, when our attention is fully on those things, so it's not on the other things, then those things, Jesus says, they can work themselves out. And our perspective is such that they can work out. If you heard Meredith's message last week, there's such a great connection here. Because her, her message about the Bible Club and her be ready moment that she talked about, that God prepares us and our our opportunity is just to be ready when God calls us and leads us into things. And that's this. I mean, seek God's kingdom and live righteously so that we're ready for God to work and God to call and God to move. And we can join God in what God's doing. It's being ready. So I wonder, what one thing could we do so that at the end of today, or at the end of any day, we could say, I sought God's kingdom today. I lived the way that the kingdom wants me to live. I mean, it, it can be just ordering things differently, so our attention is on that. It could be cutting something out and bringing something new in. It could be getting rid of something that's not wise and putting something in its place. I mean, it can be any kinds of things. But how could we do something... So at the end of the day, we could say, I sought out God's kingdom. That's where our attention is. And Jesus says, where our, our treasure is, our heart will be also. When our attention is on it, then our lives follow suit. So, would you stand? And I think we have a song to sing.